some of the most well-made, well-balanced, and beautiful deck builders I've ever played are the ones I seldom replay due to their failure to pass an important, invisible test. Are they different enough from Slay the Spire to pull me away from it? Like it or not, that's the bar you've got to clear when you're stepping into a genre whose urtext is so evergreen and so infinitely replayable. Thankfully, Book of Demons Hellcard does clear it. It gets the fundies right. Many viable builds, clear card rules, and readable UI are present. But its central gimmick is actually that it's kind of a genre mashup owed to all the assets it's sharing with its sister game from the same studio, the ARPG Book of Demons, no subtitle. This incestuous development relationship gave Hellcard many flavors of origami-like skeletons and imp assets to use, and boy does it use them. Hordes are your usual enemies rather than individually strong baddies, which gives Hellcard a focus on crowd control and target prioritization to a higher degree than its peers. It's satisfying and strategic, and tickles that tactical itch extremely well. And yet, its play again button isn't as attractive as I would hope among all of those virtues. The crumple on this otherwise enjoyable papercraft deck building roguelite is just how fatiguing it is to play. Average run duration can easily cross the 100 minute mark, and many of those minutes aren't as strategic as the others thanks to prolonged fights that are over well before you hit the victory screen. I enjoyed my time with Hellcard, but that enjoyment is past tense. I think it's worth a play, but maybe not the infinite play that all these meter based progression hooks and stacking difficulty options suggest it's capable of. The horde based enemy structure is actually only one of two major design changes Hellcard makes from the deck building standard. The other is a party focus. You can actually play Hellcard multiplayer if you've got a dorky enough friend group, and it's the encouraged way to play based on co-op's top status in the main menu. Even if you don't bring any pals, you still see this extra dimension manifested into the game's rules. You pick up AI companions on your way down hell, each with their own decks, their own passive boosts, and their own health and resources. It sells the illusion that these are companions and not just extensions of the self, but making them semi-autonomous. They build their own decks, and they largely pick their own paths down the roguelite lanes. Mid-battle you can directly play their cards as though they were your own, but those plays are beholden to some slightly nerfed drawing rules. You have to pick between two randomly selected cards in their hands, rather than selecting freely among all of them, almost as though you're nudging them into certain styles, rather than controlling them directly. Depth reveals itself pretty quickly, especially given the small wrinkle that you're not locked into a party from the start. The fact that companions can be encountered and swapped out at certain points mid-run opens up a lot of macro decision making. You can front load power by selecting damage dealing allies like the Warrior and the Barbarian early on, then swap them out for more supporting roles like the Frostmancer and the Cleric once your main dude is a powerful enough engine. It also lets you strategically distribute damage because the new party members come in at full health. You need to take full advantage of all of these plays because Hellcard is tough. Your tactical opportunities are multiplied tenfold because the enemies you're targeting are multiplied tenfold. Every fight opens with you taking stock of key threats and incoming damage, then playing the balancing act of executing core targets while retaining enough block to mitigate your enemies trying to do the same. For the most part, it's a joy, and enough can't be said about how well the UI keeps up with the demanding job of making dozens of enemy intents readable. Incoming damage numbers are shown in plain text, but they're also styled and colored differently if that damage exceeds your block, or if that damage is lethal. And you're always one mouse hover away from seeing what the exact sources of that incoming damage are too. Peeling your way through an encounter slowly but surely is fun, especially in the lower floors of hell. Battles will frequently start with you in check, thanks to all the heavy area damage the horde intends to deal upon you. And within your first turn, you need to both prevent that from going to mate, and flipping the script back to an offensive position with a combo of stuns, freezes, and kills. The fights themselves are more than just slay the spire with higher enemy counts though. There's an almost intentional deflation of power here that forces you to engage with party-wide mechanics, and you can clearly see that in two ways. First is that some of the most powerful cards in the game are ones that spur extra draw and give extra damage to party mates, not the person playing the card. You gotta think wide to take advantage of these instead of just funneling power into singular cards or characters. Second is how passives tend to stack. That deck builder's nut dream of going giga hard on multiplying damage boosts and then realizing them in a singular powerful attack is less common here than you might be used to. Those passive damage boost cards either come fitted with a literal unstackable keyword, or they just extend duration upon second play instead of increasing power. 
These subtle decisions push Hellcard's build crafting into a style that discourages single-mindedness, and maintaining the conflicting build needs is great fun. So why do I always jump to something else after one run? I know it sounds nitpicky, I don't want to take away from the fact that Hellcard is a well-constructed, tightly balanced, and strategically satisfying deck builder. But it's also one that didn't hook me for those multi-run sessions in the same way the best roguelites, deck builder or otherwise, do. That's not entirely a bad thing, at least part of that is because it's mealy, not snacky, and crammed with thousands of micro decisions that make each run individually filling. But at both the micro and the macro level, it's just a little exhaustingly long. Outside of cards that can target an area rather than a specific enemy, and the fact that the arenas are carved into pizza slices, there's really nothing at the systems level that recognizes the 3vx gameplay style. The fights have an inverted difficulty curve. The only turns that pose any threat are the first few, the turns where the enemy forces are at their greatest. But once you've removed the priority targets, the rest of the fight is a challenge of stabilizing and then just going through the motions to kill what remains, at least outside of a few bosses specifically designed around summoning and long-term attrition. This is a frequent occurrence, where you've already won but just need to cycle through your deck enough times over the course of multiple minutes to tell the game that. So often it feels like you've decapitated the snake and just need to keep punching its death rattling body over and over again till you get that victory screen. It's begging for extra mid-fight variables to spice that second half of the fights up, or for some sort of accelerant that speeds you through what's already trivial. To be clear, the game is not easy. It will beat you up, but that difficulty is highly concentrated into a fight starting burst where you're spinning the most plates, and then completely falls off a cliff from there. Multiply that dynamic 12 times for each floor of hell, and that's what gets you run durations that can oftentimes be counted in hours and not minutes, for better or worse. I got something worthwhile out of Hellcard in the 15 hours I spent with it. It's a beautiful deck builder whose party and multi-enemy encounters give it plenty of texture amongst its genre. At times its actual fights have a minutes to meaningful decisions ratio that doesn't feel tuned tightly enough, but all the interesting ways you can craft and pivot your builds mid-run make it worthwhile regardless. This book of demons is worth reading, the only question you'll need to ask yourself is how many chapters. <laughs>